Ben Smith. Thanks for joining me this morning. Thanks for having I me. I want to start by reading you an old quote from Mr. Pulitzer, and I want to get your perspective on it, right? He once said, real journalism must oppose privileged classes and public plunderers, never lack sympathy with the poor, always remain devoted to public welfare, never be satisfied with merely printing news, always be drastically independent, never be afraid to attack wrong. Would you say that that's a fair assessment of the press today? I mean, I guess I, I think that sounds about right. Um, you know, I think what the press is is so splintered now that it's hard to assess it. It's hard to assess it as a whole, or even at these days to almost even assess one publication as a mm -hmm. whole. Things are so atomized. So, in the case of the the UK election that's just happened, a uh, landslide Conservative victory, majority of that based off the back of a of a Brexit vote. Um, that was a bit of a wake-up call for sort of hard-leaning left, sort of, sort of socialist, you know, rebirth. What kind of lessons can the U.S. learn, particularly on the Democratic side going into 2020, and in terms of how the press managed that? Because there was a huge kind of outcry from the public around the way the press dealt with the conservative side of campaigns and with the, with the Labour side. Um, the more democratic side, which was which was highly unusual, not just on the publication side, but into you know state-run TV, the BBC, and things like that. Yeah, I mean, I think let's see, it's, it's two separate questions, and I'll kind of take them separately. I think you know r the immediate reaction, which you saw Joe Biden immediately come out and say, "See, this is what happens when you nominate socialists. You know, they they lose." Um, <laughs> and and I think that's you know the the, the pendulum in the, in the American election was already swinging that way. Oh, toward a sort of like, uh-oh, Donald Trump looks very strong, we need to play it safe. Mm -hmm. um, that's a kind of a pendulum that tends to swing inside democratic politics, and, but I think the, U the UK election gave it a push there. I th you know, the, the counter argument in some sense is that you know, Trump, Boris isn't Trump. Boris is an ex sort of seen as an extremist really only on one issue, which is Brexit. He's a kind of a Tory moderate on everything else. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in some sense, the U.S. had elected, you know, Nigel Farage. That's who Trump is. So it's it's a, it's a kind of a different landscape, yeah. but still, right? The notion that a right that that a kind of hard old lefty who, you know, who who appealed both to the kind of kind of nostalgia and inspired this kind of new socialist generation was a great nominee. Yeah, may, may, maybe not so much. But although, I do think that you know the, the Brexit story is so specific. And then, right, Brit, the, there's lots and lots of anger on the losing side at the media. Um, really hard, for, it's, it's a bit hard for me to see from afar how this was the media's fault. You know, nobody forced Jeremy Corbyn to take no position on the most important issue in the country for years. That wasn't like the media. It seems, it seems to me that it was fought to some degree on the, on the substance, but there's a, um, I do think this question of, uh, there seemed, it seemed to me from afar that there was a lot of pressure on the BBC and others to kind of call out what they saw as lies by Boris Johnson and his campaign around particularly policy issues, particularly health care. Um, and I think the US media has decided, and it's a much easier call, like Trump just lies all the time. It's yeah. not, you know, it's not, and not about complicated policy matters, about what color the sky is. And so, so the US media have come around to saying, well, he's lying here. That turned out that using that word did not have some magic power. So then, what kind of conversations do you have internally in the newsroom with a situation like this? Like you said, lies don't seem to be an issue. What does that mean for the press today? Um, I mean, I think the, the crisis in the US is just that there's been this very deliberate campaign led by Trump against the press and to discredit the press that has largely worked with his supporters. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's not, you know, so I think, you know, there's a big, there's a lot of conversation in trust, how do you win back trust, but it's not a static situation, it's a situation where where you have very powerful actors with big megaphones who have an interest in undermining that and in countering you as you try to win people's trust. I think from my perspective, and particularly if you don't have a trusted brand, if you can't say trust us because we've been doing this for 100 years, nobody, nobody thinks, well, BuzzFeed, you know, they've been around forever, so I trust them, we're new. And so mm -hmm. I think the way we see trust is that we, you know, is that we don't really expect you to, take, to trust us just, just to trust us. We want to kind of show you the receipts in some sense. So we rely very heavily on documents. We do a lot of FOIA, FOIA lawsuits. We, you know, publish, we, we, we are very heavily on the side of publishing the original documents where we can and, and, and sharing with our audience what we know, what we don't know. And I think that's, I think in, in, in an environment where you can't just say, trust me, 
what you can try to do is, is show the receipts. Sure. And then how did that come about? Because as I mentioned before, with, with BuzzFeed, I think surely in some audiences at least, there's probably still a perception that it's very much a, a kind of consumer, playful content driven, yeah. driven news organization. But that's just absolutely not the case, right? Well, I would say, like when I started, we were all cat. You know, we were the world's leading site for lists of cute cats, and yeah. I think we still are. Like we do tons <laughs> and tons of fun, kind of fun web culture. But we have both built a news operation and separated it out a bit and made sort of clearer distinctions of what's news and what's entertainment. Because we, th we sort of got the sense that's what the audience wanted. Um, yeah, but 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 it is also true that we are not in a position. I would say that no one is in a position, but we feel this very intensely, just to say, hey, you know, trust our brand. We've been bringing you news for a hundred years, and so we have to say, you know, here's what we know. Here's how we know it. Here's why you should trust us.